Hello, welcome to Tashi Talks Build 2023. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a tool that I developed called TFX. First, a little bit about me. My name is Tom Straub. I am a staff resident architect here at HashiCorp, uh, which really just means that I work with some of our biggest customers, helping them uh, deploy, adopt, and scale Terraform Enterprise within their organization. Uh, I've been using Terraform since uh, the 0 0.6 days uh, and you know has earned me the nickname Terraform Tom. The rest is kind of history, as they say. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or our GitHub at the links below. So TFX, what uh, what brought this about? Well, TFX is a standalone CLI for Terraform Cloud and Terraform Enterprise. Now, uh, those two platforms are, one, our public hosted SaaS, and the other one is our uh, private installed uh, platforms. Uh, this tool, as the name might suggest, works with both. Uh, I will probably exclusively use Terraform Enterprise when referring to the platform. Uh, but, you know, the, there is large feature parity between the two. Uh, obviously, Terraform Enterprise, slightly more functionality because you are hosting it. Uh, but with TFX, uh, this started back in 2021. Uh, that's when the tool, uh, when I first develop, started developing the tool. Since then, uh, the latest release has about 30, uh, 31,000 uh, plus downloads. So uh, we're seeing some, you know, decent usage out there in industry, which is great. Uh, and today, uh, it has about 50 plus commands to be able to interact with. You can find it on GitHub and there's the link there below. But, uh, you know, let's jump into why did I build this tool? Well, selfishly, I wanted to learn Go. Uh, I'm a developer at heart, uh, you know, having worked with Terraform uh, a lot, you know, got a little bit away from doing pure development and wanted to cut my teeth on something new. And Go seemed like a good language to learn. Uh, but second, what I found myself doing was uh, writing a lot of bash functions and uh, shell scripts to try to do some common tasks. Uh, it was becoming more difficult to share these, uh, you know, and, and error handling and checking. You know, I'm not a bash wizard, so it caused me a little bit of pain. Some of these things I had actually kind of converted into Python, uh, but ultimately I landed on Go as kind of the, 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 the language that I wanted to use. Really glad that I did because it's uh, been, been a good journey so far. Also, you know, while GUIs are great, uh, I work for an automation company. I like to work in the CLI. Uh, you know, that's that's where I'm most comfortable. So a CLI made sense. Also, not everything that you can do with uh, within the platform is available in the in the UI. So that's another thing. Uh, but lastly, you know, the customers that I work with and, and the things that I do day to day are at scale. Uh, so something that might be easy to do one to ten times it becomes really difficult when you have to do it a hundred or a thousand times, right? So with all this being said, that's, you know, that's why I decided to build this tool. Seemed like a functional way to learn Go and also have a real value add uh, to, to the industry. Well, let's talk about what can TFX actually do? Well, the first thing that it started with was uh, this wrap around the API-driven workflow. Now, we're not going to go too deep here, but if you're familiar with how workspaces interact, with uh, you know your Terraform code within uh, Terraform Enterprise or Cloud, uh, if I create a trust between my VCS and Terraform Enterprise, uh, you know some of this thing, these things kind of happen automatically for me. And while that's great, uh, and those are really strong workflows, that uh, technical uh, uh, connection isn't always possible within my customers. Uh, but also there might be some more advanced things that I want to be able to do that the API can unlock. And really what that resulted in was a lot of, like I said, bash scripts, boilerplate jobs, things like that, uh, just calling a lot of curl to curl commands just to do all these basic things. And uh, so the first the first idea there was just to make that a little bit more uh, seamless and to be able to handle uh, the things that I needed to handle uh, when executing jobs within the platform. But what I quickly identified was there were a whole lot of other things that I could do uh, to make my job a little bit easier. Uh, and managing workspaces was one of them. Uh, you know, being able to uh, you know list available workspaces and get IDs around config versions and runs and states, uh, being able to interact with variables. These are all things that I can do with TFX. Um, that uh, you can certainly do most, if not all, these things in the UI. But again, kind of becomes a little bit problematic at scale um, or uh, makes things a little bit cumbersome when um, you know you have to do it multiple times. 
Uh, next, you know, the private registry. Uh, this is uh, a feature within the platform that has kind of grown over time. Uh, we can now publish modules and providers, which is really great. Uh, but interacting with them, um, again, if I don't have a version control system that's it, trusted for modules, um, I have to do some of these things myself via the API. Uh, providers, those those that publishing workflow, it, there is no VCS connection available. So, you know, I have to manage those as well. So with TFX, I can kind of, you know, create and list and show and delete and download, do all those things that I want to be able to do with, uh, specifically with modules and providers within the provider registry. Allows for some, uh, some really nice workflows. And then again, you know, going back to Terraform Enterprise, self-hosted, self-managed platform. Uh, HashiCorp is constantly making uh, changes and updating uh, features or adding features to the platform. So if I'm managing that platform, I need to update it. Uh, so I want to be able to view releases. Um, I want to be able to download uh, what we would call maybe an air gap binary, uh, something that, uh, you know, for those systems that don't have egress out. Uh, and again, for a lot of my big customers, that's not something that's possible. I have to store everything within an air gap environment. So this allows me easy way of being able to download those binaries. TFX can certainly do more than this, but these are kind of the high level bits that I wanted to show. And we'll, when we get into the demo, you're going to see some of these things as well. Now, uh, okay, Tom, you've piqued my interest. TFX sounds good. How how do I get started? Well, first step, go to tfx.rocks. That's where the docs are stored. Um, everything in here is uh, uh, markdown generated uh, using a tool called MK Docs. Very popular, handy uh, markdown uh, static website builder. A uh, lot of really good stuff in here. Uh, like I said, stored in the repository, uh, some GitHub actions that kind of trigger this, uh, make things really nice and keeps everything nice and in, in sync. Um, so that's where I would start. Uh, there's a lot of good documentation in there and you can kind of find out more about the commands even before you download. Next, uh, once you do have it downloaded, uh, we need to authenticate. Uh, obviously we're dealing with systems that have authentication in place. Uh, with every command, we have this option that we can pass in uh, these arguments, specifically host name, organization, and token. Uh, this is great, but there's no fun in this having to provide this every time. So really give you this nice, uh, you know, uh, settings file equivalent option as well as environment variables. So really what this means is I can actually, uh, if I create a .tfx.hcl file, put it in my home directory, TFX is just going to automatically pick this up. And this actually works for any flag uh, available in a command, not just these three for authentication. Um, so you can create that uh, that HCL file uh, and, and, and put it in your home directory. You can also specify it at the command line when you actually execute a command. Um, now for the more specific credentials, the host name, organization, and token, also available some enterprise or environment variables that you can set as well if you want to obfuscate that from the runtime and not have it uh, you know, sitting in a file on disk. So... Uh, the name of the game here, flexibility, right? I uh, want to be able to uh, allow folks to use this in, in any way that they can um, within reason and, and you know, uh, be able to authenticate uh, cleanly and, 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 and safely, right? The other thing that you would want to know before you get started here is just that basic command structure. Uh, I think this is going to be really natural. Uh, you know, there's a lot of these uh, nested subcommands. So everything starts at TFX, obviously. Uh, but if I'm dealing with registry uh, commands, that's going to be the registry subcommand. So TFX registry module will be for module uh, publishing. Uh, TFX registry provider will be for provider of publishing. Uh, the good news is anything, um, any command that you have, you can add this dash H argument um, and you can uh, get a, a, an output similar to you're seeing here. And that'll allow you to kind of investigate what is needed to execute a subcommand and maybe what arguments are needed. Um, or what other subcommands are, are, are nested in, inside of it. So I think it flows fairly simply. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you, you, it'll, it'll, it'll be real natural for most people. Now, when it goes to output, uh, you know, if I'm at a terminal leveraging TFX, I might want to see something like this, uh, a, what I would call a table output, right? Um, it's also going to maybe uh, present some common configuration information about what's going on here. And um, I do want to highlight that there is a style guide on the docs. And you'll notice here that some of these colors actually are very intentional. So green is really representing values that are provided by the user. Now, in this case, I just wrote TFX workspace list, but my config file is actually has that value. But the config file itself is this yellow color, 
uh, maybe orange, depending on how you look at it. And uh, what it does is anything that's uh, calculated at runtime. So in this case, um, there's a convention where that file might live. And if it exists, I'm going to use it, which is what's happening here. Uh, and you'll notice it found one workspace. Again, I didn't know that when I ran the command, it was calculated based on the platform. Um, now, this is great. If I want to be able to leverage this from a terminal, this makes a lot of sense. However, like I said before, where's the fun in that, right? Uh, I fully expect uh, this CLI to be used in uh, you know, uh, some kind of build server, some kind of automated workflow. So being able to support JSON output, very, very critical, right? Um, so in this case, if I had dash dash JSON to pretty much any command, not all commands work this way, but almost all of them, I'd say a solid 90% of them, what happens is it'll output the only output that'll get, you won't get any intermediate values. It'll just give you the result and it'll be properly formatted JSON. Now here I'm using JQ, which is really just a, a command line utility. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's actually creating this kind of, uh, you know, prettified output here with the blue and the, and the green and the, and the spacing and things like that. Um, it's not changing the format of the actual file, just presenting it a little bit differently. What it also allows me to do, and there's other tools that do this as well, is I can pull out certain values here. And this allows me to chain these commands together. So I might be able to call this, get an output, and then call another command. Could be TFX, could be something else, right? So very powerful. So JSON, that output mode is very, very much a, a, a front focus for this tool uh, because it's expected to be leveraged within uh, automation, right? Okay. Well, with that, let's go ahead and jump into a demo. Before we go there, what I do want to highlight is I do have this uh, Terraform Enterprise instance that is out here. This is just an ephemeral instance, nothing magic going on here. Uh, this will get deleted uh, after this demo is over. So any tokens you see are not really going to put us at risk here. Um, they will be uh, uh, retracted or revoked well before uh, this uh, hashy talks occurs, right? Um, and then here's the registry. We'll see this here in a second. So let's let's jump into the demo. Now, First thing that I want to do is I'm just going to run a TFX-D. So this is version 011, which is out there available. Um, that's what most people are using today. Uh, and if I go ahead and run a command, in this case, I'm just going to run something simple like a TFX workspace list. So give me a list of workspaces. Now you'll notice that it's actually kind of yelling at me saying, hey, you're missing some items. Well, that's because I haven't given it any authentication uh, yet. So what I'm going to do is I just have a little, a quick little script here. What that's going to do is going to generate that .tfx.hcl file. So when I run tfx workspace list again, what's going to happen is you'll see, hey, look, using that config file. So if I click into it, you'll see here's my file. Now, again, don't get too worried about this. This token is going to be long revoked before anyone sees it here. If you want to try to attack, go ahead. Uh, this Everything will be gone before you get a chance to. Uh, but here, um, I have a few workspaces in here just to drive some demonstration, uh, in this case, four. Uh, but with that HCL file created, now I don't. I can just run TFX commands. I don't have to constantly give it a token organization, anything like that. Now, if I wanted to target a different organization, I can obviously override it the command line, or I can go back to that config file and update. But uh, with authentication in, uh, in play or, or completed, let's go and talk a little bit about some of the fun stuff we can do. I mentioned scale. Well, one of the things that I uh, have done quite a bit is I need to lock all my workspaces um, for whatever reason. Maybe it's a maintenance thing, uh, you know, but, you know, locking a thousand workspaces kind of takes a long time. So what I can do here is if I want to lock all these, I'm just going to go ahead and run TFX workspace lock all. And you'll notice here, uh, this is relatively quick because there's only four. Um, I can go through here, lock all my workspaces, right? Now, if I rerun that list command, you'll see now everything's locked, right? And if I uh, go here and uh, run unlock all, now what I should see is I'm going to call those commands and now everything's going to get unlocked, okay? Really simple, but this I, starts to show you some of the value of, of what's going on um, within the tool. And if I wanted to actually do uh, something even a little bit more interesting, I could actually output to JSON and let me do a JQ just to get kind of a, a clean look. Now you can see all the things that I'm being uh, available. Some of these commands don't uh, print everything in the table just to keep it, uh, you know, uh, keep it concise. Uh, so there might be more information available there. Uh, all right. Workspace locking, not super interesting, but kind of one of those nice things to have that I use quite a bit. Uh, let's talk about variables. So in this case, um, I, I have this workspace called 
test variables. And if I jump back over to Terraform Enterprise and look here, you'll notice test variables is my workspace. I have no variables, right? Nothing's in here, um, no fun. Well, let's let's go and change that. So if I click or if I query against uh, the API, you know, boom, hey, there's no there's no variables in there. That's what, kind of what I expected. Um, but let's go ahead and create uh, a few variables. Now, a couple of things. One, you'll notice WS, Tommy didn't spell out workspace. VAR didn't spell out variable. There's some shorthand that is going on here. It makes things a little bit easier to kind of type out. Uh, certainly, you can use the, the full form, workspace, variable, create, all those things, right? Uh, just one of those nice kind of quality of life things that I've added. Uh, but here, I'm, I'm going to add three variables this first go. These are relatively simple. You'll see my names are variable one, two, three. You know, hey, fun things. But what I've done is I've added different descriptions. I've marked one as sensitive, and I've marked the other one as an environment variable. So let me go ahead and execute all three of these. And you'll notice they kind of worked in succession. Also print out some information, you know, afterwards. Now, if I go and do this list again, you'll notice, well, there's my three variables. I've also included the variable IDs, which can be really helpful. So let's go back to my UI. Just do a quick refresh. Look, I've got my three variables there. I've got my nice descriptions. Everything is good, right? Well, sometimes my variables are a little more complicated than just strings, right? So what I can also do is I can actually mark a, a variable in Terraform Enterprise as an HCL variable. And what that means is it's more complicated in terms of the syntax. So I have these three values or three files um, that um, are kind of common uh, data types. Here's a list. Uh, here's a map. Uh, and then this is just the basic string. This one's not really all that exciting, but let's let's look at the map. If I wanted to pass this in, in as a value, right? Uh, getting the escaping characters in there, kind of complicated, kind of cumbersome, certainly possible, but who's got time for that anyway, right? So what I can do here instead is I can actually pass in a file as the value and what it'll do is it'll write that. So let me go ahead and execute these three and we'll see kind of what happens. So like this map one, you know, hey, look, it's creating that, but you'll notice the value is more complicated. And you'll also notice that HCL is marked as true. So let's go ahead and list these one more time. And you'll notice, hey, look, those values are in there, right? And, um, you know, my description kind of matches that. So uh, if I go back to the UI, let's do a quick refresh. You'll notice that these values are you know kind of there, but I didn't have to worry about escaping. You didn't have to worry about any of that kind of stuff. So for more complicated uh, variable assignments, this is a, a really big quality of life feature that helps kind of write things. You don't have to worry about weird escaping and things like that. Okay, uh, so within that, you know, hey, creating it, giving it a workspace name, key variable, all that kind of stuff. A lot of a lot of flexibility there. Uh, of course, when I'm done, you know, hey, I can just go ahead and run my deletes. You know, go ahead and clean everything up. Um, and when I list again, now everything's gone, right? So just kind of showing you that full life cycle, nothing too too crazy there, but now I, I'm able to interact with those workspace variables. So if I have a build step that needs to write something to a workspace variable before I kick off a run, now I have the ability to do that. Okay. All right, let's move on to uh, kind of our plan and apply flow. Well, let's first take a look at um, this workspace directory, right? And you'll notice that I have this main.tf file uh, this is a relatively simple main.tf file. What I've done is I've required the random provider. Again, nothing too crazy. Uh, a prefix and account. And I'm using this random pet resource, which is really just going to give me a, a random pet name with that prefix and that number account. So I've, I defaulted the prefix to null, so it won't have a prefix. And I've defaulted the count to three, so it'll have three names. And we'll see kind of what this looks like um, as we run it. But that's the main.tf file that I'm running. So if I go ahead and execute my plan, so TFX plan, and I give it the workspace name, what it's going to do is because I'm in that workspace directory, it's going to upload that, it's going to archive and upload that file, and it's going to create that, that uh, this uh, uh, run. Now, if I click into this, what you'll notice is that run was created, and this output looks very similar to what I just saw, and it's waiting in a plot. So the reason why this is powerful is because within my workflow, I might need to do additional validation between plan and apply. I might send this out. I might actually need manual intervention within my pipeline or whatnot. But once I feel good about it and I'm like, yeah, I think that's ready to go, what I can do is I can uh, go ahead and apply that. So this would be TFX apply. And then I'm going to give it that run ID. 
So now what we should see is that it'll actually go through and uh, created the apply that we just saw. And you'll see our name has three names in it and uh, separated by a dash, again, no prefix. So if I go back to uh, Terraform Enterprise, that run, you'll see that that apply finished with the exact same output. So now what TFX has done for me is I'm able to, you know, interact at the CLI level, right? And kind of do that. Now, another good thing, let's say uh, I want to actually default my prefix to hashy, right? So I'm updating the, uh, my default. Uh, in this case, I haven't provided it. I haven't assigned that variable, so it's not going to get overridden. Now I want to run a plan, but I want to do a speculative plan. What that means is I don't actually want to ever apply this. I just want to see what would happen if I made this change. So what happens here is it's going to force a replacement of that random pet name because it's going to re regenerate. And that really has more to do with how this resource is built. And uh, change the output, good, right? Now, if I go into this uh, link, you'll notice that I can't apply it, right? And that's because it was a plan only, what we call a speculative plan, okay? Now... If I want to go ahead and apply that, I can just go ahead and run it again, this time without that speculative flag. And uh, what I'll get here is similar before, one to create, one to destroy, and I'm going to get that run ID. And if I go here and go back to apply, let's go ahead and paste this in. And what we should see here is an actual apply. And now we've got our prefix right? Our hashy prefix, and then our three uh, our three names, right? And if I want, I can go click back into here. And what I'll see is well, that's interesting. Let's go back here. Interesting. Might have a problem with that navigation. There it goes. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, little demo bug there. That's fine. All good. So let's go ahead and move on. And um, you know, I uh, I can also do a dash destroy if I want to clean up after myself, but we're not going to worry about that. Okay. So now uh, we've executed some runs. Let's look at. Uh, Let's look at some runs. So again, on that same workspace test, so TFX workspace list um, or run list, we have this uh, test. And you'll see these are a bunch of workspaces or a bunch of runs on this workspace that I've been using. Uh, you'll notice here that one that we just executed that was planned and finished true, uh, or sorry, plan only was true. Again, speculative plan, right? Uh, and then we went and applied something similar, okay? Now, what I can do here, though, is let's take a look at those that run information. So if I can do TFX workspace run and show that uh, show that run ID, and you'll notice, you know, uh, I'm getting some of a lot of the same things, but I'm getting my config version ID, I'm um, getting my run ID, which I uh, already knew, um, message from uh, how it was triggered, what tariff version, date. So again, just getting information that would be very valuable to uh, those things. Now, this is where things get real fun. What if I want to debug what is actually going on um, between uh, the uh, config version, or I want to see what config version code was actually there. I can actually come in here and let me just override this. So I'm going to grab the config version from that latest run and I'm going to download it. And I'm going to download it into my current directory. So what we see here is it created this. And if I go and look at this main.tf, you'll notice this is that same file that um, I uploaded, right? Now, consider that I might be debugging a problem that I don't know how that config version got created. This can be really powerful to be able to kind of investigate what was the exact Terraform code that was executed. Uh, I can go and investigate that. So if I'm debugging a challenge or a bug or anything like that, I, I can maybe more clearly uh, see what's going on. So I, I use this a lot. This is very, very powerful when you're trying to diagnose a problem. Okay. And, um, yeah. Okay. So with that, uh, let's take a look at the uh, registry modules. 
So uh, I'm going to go here and uh, actually I already have this one out here. So what I'm going to do is actually uh, I'm going to delete this module so we can start fresh. So stand by here. Okay. All right. So let's try this again. We have no modules out there in the registry. If I come back over here to, to the registry and refresh, you'll notice there are no modules in that registry. So what I want to be able to do here is I'm going to create a module. I'm going to call it TLS private. So let me uh, go back over here and I have a, uh, a module that I've downloaded. This is actually available on my, on my GitHub as well, but it, this is, this creates a private CA and a, a certificate based on that CA uh, leveraging the TLS uh, Terraform provider. So pretty simple stuff. I use this a lot just so I can generate uh, uh, keys that are like production. Um, so I can get them into place and then obviously have a much more robust process for, for generating these certs in, uh, in, in production. But, um, you know, typical module has some Terraform files, has my outputs, has my variables, has all the kind of basic stuff that you would expect in a, in a module. So let's go ahead and create that module. Uh, in this case, I've given it the name TLS-Private. Now, when I publish a module, I also have to give it a provider name. And usually we tick, uh, pick the, the primary provider leverage within the platform. Uh, or the module rather, in this case, TLS. So go ahead and create that. And, you know, I'm getting some information about it. Nothing too exciting. But if I go back out here and refresh, what you're going to see is that it did create it, but I haven't published anything yet. And that's because the module and the module version are distinctly different. And that's okay because I only create the module once, but I want to publish multiple versions. So if I, uh, you know, run registry module version list, right? You'll notice there's no versions because I just created it, right? So let's go ahead and create that first one. So in this case, I'm going to create it. Uh, name and provider is the same. My directory though, is this TLS private. So you'll notice I have this TLS private folder. It's actually listed right here. And um, I'm going to give it version 001. So I'm going to go ahead and create this. Now this happened really, really fast because uh, this is a very small module. There's not a lot going on here. Uh, you can imagine there, this could be quite large depending on how big your module is, uh, but it happened relatively quickly. And if I jump back over here and refresh, actually it was already there, 001 was published. And you'll notice that, uh, you know, hey, I've got Hashi Talks 2023 here, inputs, outputs, resources, everybody's happy, right? Now, um, if I go back and uh, list my versions, you'll see versions are good. Now, the reason why this OK status is important is because you can create that version. If you didn't upload properly, um, you know, it, it could cause some problems. So that status will tell you if things are looking good. In this case, they are. Um, and then what I can do here, and just to kind of show you that things are real, um, let's say update live, right? I'm just going to update the readme. It doesn't really change anything, but I just want to demonstrate. So I'm going to rerun that same command, except now I'm going to do version 002. Go ahead and run it again. Lightning fast, right? Let me go and list. Now I have two versions. But when I come back here and I refresh, I have version two, but you'll notice that the update live is now there in that read. So just kind of showing you, look, I can actually um, I can actually show that uh, that version was published and it was published directly. So no uh, no 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 tricks there. All right. Uh, one last quick one is the TFE releases. So um, uh, let me just bump up a directory here. Uh, so if I list this, uh, I've run this list command for TFE releases, it's going to go out and it's going to check these things. Now, one quick note, uh, check the docs here, but the authentication for this is different. This isn't actually reaching out to Terraform Enterprise. This is actually reaching out to Replicated, which is what stores those binaries, okay? So I'm doing a list here. And what I want to do is, hey, version, let's just look at a release 675. I can go and show, do a show. What's really cool here is it's actually going to go grab the uh the the release notes but you also see kind of hey when was it released is it required we have kind of a special label that we use and you can kind of see those things right and where uh i like to demonstrate uh the flexibility with that json is i can actually you know use that json output grab those release notes and write it to a file so let me go ahead and run this real quick and what you'll notice is i create this file and then now i've got kind of a markdown file 
that I can then, um, you know, preview and you can kind of see it in a, in a nice rendered fashion. So again, this is helpful if I'm trying to determine, you know, what version, uh, if I want to upgrade if the release notes dictate a, 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 a reason to do that. I can also download that binary. This will kind of do some stuff here. Um, I'm not going to uh, let it download the whole way, but I can download that binary and then bring it in my environment. Okay, great. So with that, uh, one last thing as I bring my slide deck back into clear here. Uh, what's next for TFX? Well, there's quite a bit in flight right now. We have a couple PRs out there that are pending approval, um, but just kind of a quick high level bullet points, uh, more robust testing. That's something that has been lacking um, for a while. Things do work relatively well, but you know we always like automated testing. So that's something that um, is really important. Uh, to get added relatively soon. Uh, Sentinel management, now that, you know, policy, policy sets, things like that. Variable sets didn't exist when I started this tool. So now they do. So I want to be able to interact with them. Terraform agents, again, really powerful. Uh, some analytics just to kind of understand how things are being used. Uh, team management, things like that. So uh, these are all things that are kind of on the roadmap. Uh, if you're interested in helping contribute, uh, you know, you can do that in two ways. You, you, you don't have to actually write Go code. You can go and uh, support, uh, submit a support issue. That's really helpful to me to understand um, uh, on GitHub is what I mean. Uh, help me understand what are some features that you're looking for, right? Maybe what is something that isn't working quite that well, things like that. That's really helpful. The other side of it, if you're interested in contributing, hey, I'd love to see uh, PRs out there uh, and you know, uh, looking forward to, to getting uh, more contributors to kind of make this tool even better than it is today. And um, yeah, looking forward to interacting with them. So GitHub issues, that's the best place to kind of kind of reach out if you're if you're interested in helping. So with that, uh, that's TFX. Really appreciate everyone joining my session today. Uh, like I said, you know, feel free to reach out uh, at, on LinkedIn or GitHub if you have any questions. And um, yeah, hope to see you out there. Thank you.